All right, it is end game. We are now in the U countries, getting closer to the end of the alphabet. This episode, Uganda. Known as the Pearl of Africa, despite having virtually no pearling industry. Along with Tanzania and Kenya, Uganda is the last member of the Swahili powerhouse triplets. Uh, don't you mean quadruplets? Yeah, it's more like your third de facto language. Plus, you guys had that weird thing with Belgium, and you guys only have like 13 million people. Yeah, but we have a consistently rising GDP index with an emerging startup industry, surpassing all other powerhouses. Okay, fine, Swahili quadruplets. Triplets. Jeez, whatever, let's move on. Uganda is a complex nation riddled with everything from crowns on the constituent monarchs to the crowns on the crowned cranes. Uganda, be kidding me. <laughs> yeah, I had to. It's time to learn geography. No! Hey everybody, I'm your host Barbs. Get your Geography Now merch like this cool mug at geographynow.com. Not selling out if it's your brand. Want to also uh, see this really cool Uganda shirt that I'm wearing? Yeah, it was made by Geography but Ruba. Remember her from the Sudan episode? She makes these shirts and if you are interested in getting an Africa logo shirt, go to unityshirtshop.com, support her business. Thank you, Ruba. And check out the Sudan episode. She was good in it with her cousin Mathani. I love diving into East Africa because the whole region is like this geothermally active yet super lush rift valley that the Bantus and the Nilotes migrated to and as you guys know, I love having people either from the country or people that have heritage from the country. And with that, say hi to our Ugandans, Paihan and Kimmy. What's poppin', man? How What's you guys up? doing? What's you guys, you guys ready up? for Uganda? Let Woo! us go. Let's do it. <laughs> So Uganda is a complicated place when it comes to the map because this legally demarcated structure of Uganda is based on colonial lines versus the traditional regions. We'll explain a little more, but first let's jump into the map with the motion graphic, shall we? Let's do it. First of all, Uganda is a landlocked country located in East Africa straddling the equator bordered by five other countries. Uganda also lays claim to the largest portion of Lake Victoria, cut close at the one degree parallel, and slicing through random island boundaries with Kenya, even though half of these islands are disputed like Mikingo, Ring. Giti, Ramba, and even Sigulu Island had a few complications even though it is under Ugandan authority. In fact, they have two other disputes, one with South Sudan over the Logoba slash Moyo districts, where the border was never formally demarcated during colonial times, so they just kind of went at it. And with the DRC, you have this little guy over here in Lake Albert, Rukwanzi Island, which had a skirmish in 2007, and since then has been occupied full-time by Congolese soldiers. The country is divided into four regions, with the capital and largest city of the country being Kampala, on the coast of Lake Victoria. Here you can also find Port Bell, the largest port, which is only a small pier where most lake-bound shipping containers are dropped off and transferred to a rail line connecting to it. Due to the layout of the city, Kampala doesn't host any airports within its metropolitan vicinity, and all travelers wishing to visit must fly to Entebbe International, which lies about 25 miles or 40 kilometers south of Kampala. This is the only international airport within the country, however, altogether there are 47 domestic regional airports and airstrips, the second and third busiest being Ora and Gulu airports in the north. Gulu actually being the third largest city of the country, the second being Mbabara in the south. All of Uganda is interconnected via paved and unpaved road networks, and they are part of the Trans-African Highway Line 8 that essentially connects West Africa from Lagos, Nigeria, all the way to Mombasa, Kenya. Uganda also has some rail lines, however, today the only one in operation is the Malaba-Kampala line. Fun side note, Kampala is one of the fastest growing cities on earth, and it produces about half the country's GDP. Also, it was ranked by global development agencies as East Africa's most comfortable city. Yes, even ahead of Kigali. So, uh, we're gonna, like, keep doing this now? You're just gonna keep throwing me into the f***ing ring? Hey, I'm just saying, you guys set high standards. You're like the Singapore of Africa. Yeah. And don't you forget it. Now, administratively, Uganda is composed of four regions. Most people in Uganda don't really even see it that way. If you really want to understand Uganda, you have to look at the traditional ruling map. Although, yes, the country is a unitary presidential republic, we'll talk more about this later, nonetheless, Uganda has one of the largest number of recognized constituent traditional monarchies and paramount chiefdoms in the world. Now, it's hard to get an exact number because some of the people groups have unclear succession practices with multiple claimants to the throne. So it's like kind of in limbo. But for the record, monarchy in Uganda goes way back, thousands of years. It is speculated that the earliest mass dominion of rule was the Kitara Empire that existed from the early Bronze Age to about 500 AD. It was ruled by these mysterious, how do you say it? Chwezi. Chwezi kings that only have oral tradition about them passed down. Chwezi. 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 Depending on how you classify or legitimize them, today there are about 30 main prominent regional kingdoms and chieftains. Generally speaking though, the five largest 
largest ones that claim territory that makes up about half of the entire country's land mass are the Bantu-based kingdoms of Busoga, Bunyoro, Toro, Ankole, and the largest one, the Baganda, which is subsequently where Uganda got its name from. And you are Buganda, or Luga Luganda, no, Buganda, right, that's the word the people. Baganda. 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 Yeah. Baganda is the people. You guys have all these prefixes to your words, I swear. <laughs> Bantu languages, man. Even Baganda, some people so hard. Say. And from there, in the north, you find the Nilotic chiefdoms, mostly the Acholi and the Karamoja. If we're going to be super technical though, there are actually six more traditional regions, including the West Nile ruled by the Sudanic chiefs, Lango, Teso, Busugu, Bukedi, and in the far south, Kigezi, making a total of 15 traditional main ruling areas. Mm -hmm. And see now, during the British colonial times, these uh, kingdoms and chiefdoms were actually made into functional subdivisions of Uganda prior to the four region system. From you guys' understanding, what is like the role of monarchy in Uganda? It's kind of like for show at this moment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because they they have no official power. I would say it's it's good for the people's morale, but outside mm. of that, and that's the part that's like heartbreaking. There is a distinct level of influence though, right? Yeah, I would say like if you see a prince or a king, they're treated as royalty, respected, and they hold a certain cu cultural value, like you said. Right. They're very structured too. Like they have their own parliament and everything, and they yeah, have their own like budget. But and you feel that is important though to have and maintain. Absolutely. Very, yeah. very. Self-esteem of the people is very important. But you, you're uh, descended from a... <laughs> oh man, you guys need to feel special. Yeah, my grandmother, she was actually um, Mutesa's uh, older sister. Yeah, so I have like royal blood, I guess some people would say. My, uh, my... Auntie Princess Buganda. <laughs> <laughs> well, another thing that withstands the time in Uganda are there famous places of notable interest that you should check out if you go to Uganda. Here is one of our geography peeps to explain. Hi everyone, my name is Rose Basemira. Uganda has so many cool places to see once you visit. Here are some of the top destinations I think you should check out. Firstly, we straddle the equator. You can see this in the town of Kayawe, just southwest of Kampala. There's even a restaurant that goes through it. We also have the amazing Kasubi tombs, which are actually a UNESCO heritage site. Bethel Church, the world's smallest church that can fit only three people. We have the Neural Rock paintings, the Ngongo Culture Center, Sese Islands, which have amazing beaches. We also have Jinja, which is the adrenaline capital of East Africa. If you love to party, definitely try out the nightlife. Ugandans know how to party. Ugandans know how to have fun. Wee wee! Tumanyo kuriobu lamo. Thank you very much, and I hope you get to enjoy Uganda if you're ever lucky enough to visit. Thank you! Very quickly, uh, favorite memories and places of Uganda that you have. Go. Ooh, man! Okay, so my favorite memory, going to people's houses at 6 p.m., which was kind of a tea time. And another thing was the mall, Garden City, which opened in the early 2000s. Also, swimming at the Sheraton in Kampala. I, I, my older cousins, they wanted to take us somewhere. We were visiting from Kenya. So it's like, hey, my out of town cousins are here. I want to kind of show them around, right? We were running down this like dirt hill, right? We were in this like big, big crib. And then there was this 15 to 20 people sitting on like fold out chairs and they're watching something and I'm like what's going on right so I look and I see a sheet um that's like stuck to the roof and they got this sheet down and there's a projector playing a movie so we're watching this and it was like a Billy Blanks movie <laughs> yeah the guy, the, guy, the guy from Tybo the yeah. Tybo guy it was a Billy a makeshift theater yeah like a so makeshift theater yeah exactly that's legit you just unlocked the memory is, is the <laughs> see, theater that's like, you, you remember right it's, yep. and sometimes they would dub them in mm. Uganda. I think this yes. one was dubbed too. I exactly. think this one was dubbed. So yeah, as you can see, so many layers to Uganda. It just gets crazy and crazier the more you peel kingdoms, monarchies, chiefdoms. It's a lot. With that, we move on to the next segment. The... So Uganda is situated in a very unique spot in the core of Africa. It may not have a coastline, but definitely has a lot of water. And not just any water, but some of the most important water in all of Africa. First, let's jump into the motion graph and explain, shall we? First of all, Uganda is situated right in the middle of two fault line branches of the East African Rift System. To the west, a line runs along the border with the DRC, and the eastern fault line lies just a few hundred kilometers past their border with Kenya. These rift systems, in a sense, elevate Uganda's overall topography, meaning that even though much of their lush green central valleys are mildly hilly or flat, it still has an average elevation around 3,200 feet or 1,100 meters above sea level and slopes northward into Sudan's plains. Each of these rift systems also gives Uganda two distinct volcanic ranges on their respective sides. On the east, the range starts with Mount Elgon, shared with Kenya, going up to the northernmost tip of Uganda, and on the west, you have the small 75 mile long, 125 kilometer long Rwenzori Range. Although short in length, the Rwenzori Mountains are the tallest mountains 
mountain range in Africa. They are also the highest non-volcanic and non-orogenic mountains, that is, a mountain range formed without being directly on the convergence of a major tectonic plate. Here you can find the tallest peak shared with the DRC, Mount Stanley, or more specifically Margarita Peak, standing at over 5,100 meters tall, 16,000 feet. It is the third tallest peak in Africa and is high enough to support glaciers and perpetually snow-capped mountain peaks. We already mentioned the largest body of water, Lake Victoria, which is the source of the Nile, but it gets a little more complicated. See, Lake Victoria, being an elevated lake, at over a mile above sea level, is drained by the Victoria Nile that empties into Lake Kyoga first, the largest inland non-shared lake of Uganda. It charges up a bit, then continues to flow and empty into Lake Albert, and then it transforms into the White Nile and then continues all the way to Egypt. And you know the rest of the story. Also, keep in mind, don't swim anywhere you want in Lake Victoria. No, and that's, that's very true. And apart from the deadly hippos and the crocodiles, there is also a risk of contracting schistostomiasis. What is that you say? Schist Schistosomiasis is a parasitic fluke worm that burrows itself into your body and lays eggs and dies. Your body reacts to said eggs with extreme inflammation until you naturally excrete them through either stool or urine passing. Yeah, so uh, don't get worms. Granted, over the years, the extreme growth in population has put a toil on the land. But nonetheless, the land is still rich in agriculture, such as coffee and even bananas. Speaking of coffee, I usually take an espresso break, but Noah's not here, he can't do a segment. So so we'll just finish off. Who better than Ugandans to talk about Uganda? So Uganda has seen a pretty noticeable economic boost in the past few decades. With an average GDP growth rate consistently hovering over the 5 to 6 percentile range, they are labeled as one of the most entrepreneurial countries, not only in Africa, but the world. For one, yes, of course, they have quite a number of mineral resources, such as copper, cobalt, limestone, and so on. And uh, also in September of 2022, about 14 metric tons of gold deposits were discovered in Uganda. It's a rich land, you heard? Speaking Speaking of which, Uganda is one of the few countries in Africa that actually has their own domestic car brand, the Kira. The state-owned and operated enterprise was founded in 2014 and has since developed Africa's first hybrid and the Kayula the first solar electric bus. Hydropower provides about 85% of the total electric energy capacity of a country. Granted, due to the ever-growing population and demand for energy, load shedding or blackouts can happen sporadically, so just be mindful in case of you visit. When load shedding would happen, there is a little device called a sigiri, which is like a mini stove made out of iron that mm. is rolled around. We put coal into it, and it's yes. kind of a makeshift <laughs> cooker. Memory unlocked. Yes. Yeah, I remember that. Exactly. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. Memory unlocked. That I remember that. Oh, stuff is coming out now. <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes you need it to be dark outside to see some of those nocturnal creatures that Ooh. Uganda is flourishing in. With that, it's time to bring out our Gary Hollow. Gary Hollow here with a sewer rat. So to summarize, Uganda is super unique because it's basically where the savannah meets the jungle. This landscape is super rich in flora and fauna, often ranking it in the top 10 most biodiverse nations in the world. Look at all those Lobelia talaki plants. <coughs> Here you can find 10 national parks and 13 wildlife reserves and sanctuaries, the largest being Murchison Falls National Park. They have nearly 350 mammal species, of course, including the Big Five. However, Uganda is more widely known for being a bird haven. With over a thousand species documented, it's estimated that about 11% of the world's birds can be found here, including the national animal which you can also find on the flag, the grey crowned crane, or the gold and crested crane. Distinguished by the stiff golden feathers atop its head that resemble a golden crown or a very spiky afro, it's majestic. <laughs> this hat here is my crown. By the way, nice new haircut, Gary. How Ooh, do you feel? I feel lighter. Not only did I get a haircut, I showered for the first time in months. Lake Bunyanyi, with its 29 islands, is known as the most popular place people go to in hopes of seeing the crane and other birds. Otherwise, Uganda is one of the only three nations that offer tours to see mountain gorillas. The windy, impenetrable forest has about half of the world's critically endangered primates, and the people wishing to see them are required to get a permit. The number of tourists is tightly controlled as to avoid disturbance. You do not want to disturb a gorilla. <laughs> 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 so those are some of the top wildlife facts on Uganda. Now I'm about to tame the wildest creature on the planet, my daughter! 
I gotta love that great crown crane. Now, another thing you can't compare it to is a luscious, hearty cuisine. They know how to handle their way around the kitchen, and that's for real. Oh, yeah. yeah. So let's discuss the food of Uganda. And who better to do it than another one of you guys, the Ugandan Geauga peeps? Go! Everyone, I'm back again, and I'm here to tell you about the food of Uganda. Firstly, within Uganda, each tribe is distinguished by their staple dishes. For example, the Acholi and Langi people have lots of dishes with millet and peanut butter. In the West, they use a shawe, which is like a mayonnaise-like sauce. The Wasoga people specialize in cassava, and the Wagishu people like to smoke bamboo shoots, which we locally call malewa. The Baganda specialize in Nwombo, which is like an African Somali. But one thing is for sure, we are the Matoke Republic. Public. Why? We love cooking with matoke. We have plenty of matoke and can put in almost any dish. Boiled, fried, stewed, mashed, whatever. We can do it. On the streets, you might find a very popular snack. Fried grasshoppers, fried white ants. Children do love this. And finally, you cannot end off Uganda without getting yourself a Rolex. And no, I'm not talking about the expensive watch. To us, a Rolex is a chapati with eggs and anything from veggies, a minced meat, sausages, rolled up to Together or roll eggs, hence Rolex, Rolex, you get the gist. It's a very popular street food. Everyone loves it. No one doesn't. Thank you, and I hope you get a chance to come to Uganda and enjoy our wonderful cuisine. Bye. Thank you. Speaking of food, favorite Ugandan food, go. We would have matoke, and then obviously we would have some greens to eat with it, right? Ugali posho with beans is really good. Love the Rolex wraps. Those mm. are actually really, really good. So as you can see, the natural side of Uganda has so many layers to peel. The only thing more complex than it would be the people of Uganda. With that, let's move on to the next segment, the... All right, guys, uh, very quickly, uh, which ethnic group or tribe or people group are you from in Uganda? Well, I am half Banyankole and half Bifumbira. Well, as for me, Kenya, um, you, uh, Congo, and then in Uganda, my tribe is the Baganda people. How would Uganda stick out from the rest of East Africa or Africa in general? I would say compared to Tanzania and Kenya, we really do not speak Swahili like that. Like <laughs> we speak English and then we break it down into different tribal languages. You know, my diverse background, I'm able to compare it and contrast. In Uganda, if you say something with a different tone, you could be changing the entire meaning of your sentence or mm. your entire meaning of the word. The one thing that unites all these languages is the cadence. That's Like the intonation, the yeah, tone. Yeah, exactly. That's why I'm so scared of some of the words I'm pronouncing. I don't know if I'm <laughs> pronouncing them right. My mom would kill me. She'd be like, no, that's not how you say it. You're doing great. You You're say doing it. Great. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. All right, cool, cool. And with that, uh, let's just break it down statistic-wise in the motion graphic. Here we go. So population-wise, Uganda is made up of about 47 million people and is one of the fastest growing countries on Earth. They added 13 million to their population in only 10 years. Also, keep in mind, about 1.5 million of these people are refugees from neighboring countries, about 85% from the DRC and South Sudan. The country is made up of about 56 tribes and ethnic groups. However, Bantu groups make up the largest demographic. In fact, the four largest tribes are Bantu and make up almost half of the entire population. They are the Baganda at about 17%, the Banyankole at about 10%, the Basoga at about 9%, and the Bakifa at about 7%. From there, the fifth largest group, the Iteso, are a Nilotic group and make up about 7%. From there, the remainder of the country is made up of other various Bantu, Nilotic, Hamitic, and Sudanic groups. Some are multi-ethnic Ugandans and a small community of Asians, mostly Indo-Ugandans, that are mostly descended from Gujarati Indians from India. So we use the Ugandan shilling as our currency. However, keep in mind, we also do not mind using euros or dollars as as well. Uganda uses the type G plug outlet and they drive on the left side of the road, you know, former British uh, colony, so left side. Now, language wise, English and as of 2022, Kiswahili are the official languages. How do you guys feel about that? So, uh, I think it's very, very important and I think it's a beautiful thing that they have done that because yes. that's going to be one of the vehicles that the African people use. We have our diversified languages and I think that's beautiful, but in addition to that, um, to make our connection a lot stronger, we need to have one unifying language. Even though not all the regions are natively Kiswahili, right. it's still kind of a unifying thing that brings right. them together and you, you support the Kiswahili right. movement. I mean, right? that's exactly. how. However, keep in mind there are about 70 other languages spoken throughout Uganda. 41 are indigenous and they are divided into four main groups. Keep in mind though that the Luganda language of the Baganda people is the most widely spoken language in the country. Religion. Today, about 85% of the country adheres to some form of Christianity, a split between Catholics and Anglicans. I was actually Anglican 
Anglican growing up. Mm. Whereas the largest minority religion being Islam is somewhere around 14%. All right, now let's bring up the topic of other groups. For one, Uganda is usually ranked in the top five refugee hosting countries on earth and is the largest refugee host in Africa. Another community that has been notable in Uganda are the Indo-Ugandans or Ugandans of Indian descent, mostly the Gujaratis of West India. In colonial times of the 19th and early 20th centuries, about 32,000 Indian laborers were brought in by the British to work on the Ugandan railway. And when it was completed, most went back to India, but about 7,000 decided to stay. The Indian community was kind of like the buffer between the British and the native Ugandan population. And and they usually had it better in terms of education and positions of employment and management. Mm -hmm. Now, after independence, there was a great period when President Idi Amin decided to expel most of the foreigners, primarily Indians, from Uganda. Without going too far into it, it basically kind of went like this. These Indo-Ugandans only make up about 1% of the population, yet they earn about a fifth of the national income. So... What's the plan? I'm going to expel as many of them as I can, confiscate about 6,000 of their homes, businesses, firms, architectural estates, and so forth as a way to give back the economy of Uganda to Ugandans. I mean, sounds good, right? How can Ugandans be against reclaiming their own country? Yeah, I have a feeling this is probably going to end up uh, pretty differently than the way you envision it will. And it did. I know this is kind of a heavy topic, but what do you guys think in regards to the whole complicated social dynamics between Indians and Africans and this whole thing that happened with Idi Amin? Oh man, I got a lot to say. You can go first. Um, I will start with kind of a personal anecdote. There is a bishop of my grandparents, Festo Kivenjere. He wrote a book, I Love Idi Amin, which is actually a book about forgiveness. Um, he was one of the religious clergy that were persecuted under Amin rule. Um, a lot of the people were unfortunately executed in stadiums in our village, um, in Kabale. But prior to him going off track, there are some things that sort of set the tone for his coming into power. So with me, it's it's uh, it's a little bit different. You know, with me personally, I know with the Baganda people, Tessa was exiled. So he was actually in England and then he had died overseas. And uh, Obote at the time was like, no, I'm not bringing his body back. One once he lost power and Idi Amin wrote, um, gained his power, one of the first things he did for the Baganda people was actually bring back um, Mutesa's body. And so when I think of Idi Amin, I don't really see necessarily the war tyrant where I'm not disputing how somebody could see that. I'm looking at it a little bit more layered. He didn't want anybody in Uganda that wasn't Ugandan. He's been like a vanguard, right? Mm -hmm. On trying to direct or push uh, Uganda forward in a certain direction. I have a completely different view. I know you do. <laughs> he, I like, know. He's like Hitler. It's it's very hard for me. I, I know. That's 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 why this yeah. is so crazy. I feel like a lot of his support probably obviously came from the Baganda people. Yes. Maybe the other groups were not so and down that, for exactly. it. Exactly. Is that kind of how it kind of unfolded a little that's bit? That's how I'm looking at it. Well, yeah, when it comes to Ugandan politics, it's very complicated. I mean, like, one guy lasted 10 days. It was like, yeah, we're not going to open up the box of worms right now. Have fun in the comments. <laughs> <laughs> Switching it up a bit and speaking of fun, one thing Ugandans like to do is play sports. And with that, here's art for the sports part. Technology has come a far way. The thing is about this technology You're is not that Steve Jobs art. A man can try, okay? So, like usual, let's start with the traditional stuff. Uganda has quite a few customary games and sports that have been practiced for centuries during the Buganda Kingdom time. The most notable sports probably being Ekigo Ekiganda, or traditional Ugandan wrestling, Kwapena, which is like a double-sided dodgeball game, and Dulu, or Ugandan-style finger pull. Otherwise, in a more organized federation sense, Uganda has participated in every Summer Olympics since 1956, except the 1976 Montreal Olympics where they were protesting. Not gonna get into that. Anyway, since then they've racked up 11 medals, including four golds, all in running events. John Akibua won the first gold in 1972 Munich Olympics, and this lady, Peruth Shamutai, won the first gold in women's event. Apart from that, all the other medals are in boxing. Yes, Uganda is kind of a boxing enthusiast country. One Ugandan uppercut, and you're Uganda. Otherwise, of course, many Ugandans will claim that soccer or football is their favorite sport. We say that in every episode, why, right? Why That's soccer, they, right? Why would, they, why would they call that football? You're kicking with your foot into a net. I don't get it. 
Yeah. The rest of the world That's definitely wrong. soccer. Yeah, because you sock the ball. You sock it. You <laughs> sock it with your foot because you're wearing a sock. Wearing a... Okay, high five. Yeah. We figured it out. American logic, buddy. Unfortunately, they have never qualified for the World Cup. However, they did finish second in the Africa Cup of Nations in 1978. All right, so that's about it for the sports part. I'm out of here. And remember, guys, when in doubt, flex it out. Unless you're weak and useless. Okay, see ya. Thank you, Art. My grandmother was actually one of the first women to play uh, football really? in Uganda. So you come from Baganda royalty and you come from athletic royalty. Damn. Let's get it, well, man. What, what, are the, what is this guy I brought let's, on the show, Let's man. get it, man. <laughs> let's get it. Well, speaking of heritage, let's bring it over to Hannah to cover some interesting facts in the culture segment, shall we? Go, Hannah, go. Geographies, what's up? I'm back. And remember to get a random Hannah shirt at geographynow.com. And speaking of clothing articles, Uganda has a myriad of traditional costumes, both used at events and sometimes even worn daily on the streets. The most common one you will find on women will probably be the Gomesi dress, characterized by its high square shoulder pads, long hem, and kitambala sash tied around the waist. The most common men's attire at social events is usually the kanzu, a long white tunic similar to the Arab thobe, usually accompanied by a dress jacket. British actor of Ugandan descent Daniel Kaluuya even wore one to the premiere of Black Panther and Ugandans loved it. Guess what? Uganda also has the bride prize tradition. Depending on what region and tribe you are part of when getting married, the groom and his family usually have to pay a large fee to the bride's family for sending her off. In the cities, this is usually gifts or money. In the rural areas, it's usually livestock. In 2015, Uganda's Supreme Court actually made it illegal for a husband to demand a bride price refund in the case of a divorce. Ooh. Can't get your money back! Arts and media! Woo! Believe it or not, Uganda has a fast-growing cinematic industry and many people attribute it to Wakaliwood films. Many documentaries have been made on this topic and in 2005, Isaac Godfrey Jeffrey, Nambwana aka the Quentin Tarantino of Uganda, started his own low-budget action movies filmed around the Wakaliga slum of Kampala. He did all the directing and editing himself. Clips of his movies went viral online and suddenly the whole world fell in love with features like Who Killed Captain Alex and Bad Black. They were even featured in the Seattle International Film Festival and earned an encore presentation. One guy just wanted to have fun and suddenly it became an industry. Well, another industry in Uganda would be the music industry and normally I'm really bummed about this segment, but right now I'm so pumped because... Keith's not here, so I brought my other half to do the segment. That puts me in an awkward position. But the music in Uganda has an interesting backstory. Every tribe and ethnic group has their own distinct style of vocals, dances, and instruments. But the most popular traditional style would probably be the fast-paced baksimba, which uses fast percussion made up of gourd rattles, cowhorn trumpets, and various stretched animal skin drums. This is usually accompanied by the muwagola dance, performed by women, which feature feather belts tied around the waist to accentuate the rapid hip shaking. Bakasimba has made its way into modernity and has been incorporated in contemporary Ugandan music, the most well-known genre probably being the Kadongo Kamu, created by the Baganda people in the 1960s. Some say Fred Masagasi being the father of that genre. The guitar was used as sort of a substitution to imitate the bass drum used in Bakasimba and the rest is history. In fact, there's a word in the Lugandan language, Nyege Nyege, which means an irresistible urge to dance. And so, Uganda made the Nyege Nyege International Music Festival. The events include performances mostly focusing on Eastern African artists, but also include some from outside Africa. Otherwise, contemporary Ugandan artists today have worked their way up into the mainstream African music scene. Kimmy has an interesting story on how she got a number one hit in Uganda. So I'm out, back to Kimmy, she's awesome. See ya, later. Thank you. By the way, you guys are both musicians. Yes, yeah. yes, yes, oh. yes. So fun fact, I actually had a radio number one hit in Uganda in 2012, oh, nice. inspired by Navio, who was a huge Ugandan artist. One of the people who put me on was Lillian of the very big pop group Blue 3, and Pion's also an artist as well. Huh? Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, that's actually how we met. Mm -hmm. So you can go to PS Rebels Everything, you could check out our music. You and your brother, right? Yeah, me and my brother. We're working on new videos now, and I'm always open to like, Support the artists. So collaborating the artists. with new artists, man. Gotta plug the co the guest host, man, as much as possible. <laughs> plug, plug, right. plug. Thank you so much, Paul. <laughs> Well, we've covered so much. The only thing left to talk about are the friends of Uganda. This is gonna be an interesting one. Let's jump into it. 
All right, so Uganda knows how to interact with their friends and neighbors. Why don't we go a little bit more into depth about it on the next uh, motion graphic coming up? Let's Keep do that. It. First of all, outside of Africa, Uganda has had ties to the UK after independence, and many of the Indo-Ugandans were granted permission to move to the UK during the expulsion years under Idi Amin. Today, they have had multiple aid projects and high-level diplomatic visits that have taken place between the two countries. During Idi Amin's rule, Libya actually became a close friend, and Gaddafi invested a lot in the country and supported them in liberation war. They even built a mosque named after Gaddafi. Today though, less attention has been focused on between the two since Libya has had to deal with more of their own internal affairs due to current events. If we're going to talk about their best friends, however, we have to bring it back to East Africa. For one, South Sudan and the DRC are, as mentioned in the episode, the largest refugee nations that arrived to Uganda. The three countries have had lots of interaction between them and their ethnic groups, dating back centuries even before current borders were established. Rwanda is kind of seen as like the stable, strict, clean, organized neighbor friend that acts nice to them, but is kind of low-key competing with them in almost every field. Both of them kind of secretly want to see who can out-economic growth spurt the other, but they still love each other and get along well. It's like the best competing friendship in East Africa. Meanwhile, Burundi is watching in the corner, taking notes, hoping they can do the same eventually. When it comes to their closest friends, however, more or less, most Ugandans that I talk to have said that it's either Tanzania or Kenya or both. Generally speaking, these three countries are the trifecta powerhouses that keep East Africa afloat. Nearly everything trade-wise, finance-wise, education-wise, and even culture-wise goes through these three countries when it comes to East African affairs. They all pretty much started the whole Kiswahili revolution that initiated the first indigenous lingua franca to be used on the African continent and being an official language of the AU. They share the same history of being former British colonies and hence they also speak English. They also share the same foods, the same dance moves. They often intermarry and have families. And overall, these three get each other the best out of all other countries. In conclusion, you two are the Ugandans. I gotta give this to you. I'm out. Uganda, you are awesome. Entrepreneurial, as we've learned, a drive to keep pushing despite the limits that have been placed on us. You know, Uganda just continue having this spirit and, and protecting the essence of what it means to be a, a Ugandan. So that's why I think it's very, very important for Ugandans to continue controlling our direction and controlling what we want to do. And as you see, y'all have just rocked with us this whole time. We just barely touched the surface, but it's a very rich and diverse history. And let's keep it that way. One love. Cool. Stay this tuned. was cool. We held it down. Yeah, you guys held it absolutely. down. That was really great. All right, guys. So uh, stay tuned. Ukraine is coming up next.